thanks for that introduction, um, Chris, and thanks for the opportunity to be with you today to talk about the First Nation Infrastructure Institute. And um, I can see the uh, attendees. Uh, I can't believe there's 250 people that are uh, keen on attending this. I, I, um, that's a lot of people, and I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to learn about this. I, I do think it's a really important initiative. Um, with the potential to improve the lives for a lot of people. Um, but I also know there's lots of things happening. I think Dr. Bonnie is doing her press conference right now. So um, you could all be doing different things. So I do, really do um, appreciate you taking the time to listen in today. I'm today from the shared territory of Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Um, I'm here at, the, at Esalon in North Vancouver. Um, I am a Squamish Nation member. But as Chris mentioned, for well, uh, the last couple of years anyway, I have been doing a lot of work with this initiative on the First Nation Infrastructure Institute. And I, I got started <clears throat> with this initiative when um, former Chief Manny Jules, the Chief Commissioner of the Tax Commission, um, asked me if I want to get involved and help out. Um, and it didn't take me very long at all to say, of course, I would like to help out. Anything to do with infrastructure, I think, would be a really helpful idea. The reason that I, I think that is, is partly due to my experience with my own community, Squamish. Um, you know, our community has a, has a housing uh, shortage and we have a lot of members who would like to live in the community who don't have the opportunity right now. We don't have uh, enough land on the North Shore to be able to house um, people, at least not in the same density that we're doing. Um, and so one of the initiatives that has been undertaken over the last well, 10, 15 years was to acquire some more land in the Squamish Valley. And um, and the nation uh, did that. But in the course of doing that, uh, there was a lot of due diligence that had to be done. And what I began to learn is that the land costs were actually relatively small in comparison to the infrastructure costs to service lots for housing for members. So I recognized, um, you know, even a nation relatively uh, strategically located with opportunities to generate its own revenue. Provision was significant and the challenges of providing that were significant. And, uh, I, you know, we see this situation with many nations, I think, across the country. Um, so I have been working with uh, the Institute, as I mentioned, um, you know, the problems, I think, with, uh, with Indigenous infrastructure have been well documented. Um, with many studies and reports. We know it takes too long to do projects, to build them. They uh, it cost too much and they don't last very long. And the result of that is that we have a so-called infrastructure gap. The difference between infrastructure levels we see off reserve compared to the infrastructure we see on reserve. And that gap has been quantified in a number of different studies in the tens of billions of dollars um, you know, when we think of it across the country. I think I think the pandemic has actually, you know, exacerbated or, or laid bare, I guess, the, the extent of that infrastructure gap. But, you know, today we're able to connect um, through this webinar um, software. And fortunately, I have access to high-speed internet. And, um, you know, that's not always the case for all communities across the country. Um, and, and even the basic infrastructure, of course, though, we take for granted maybe of water and wastewater uh, the, these things aren't um at the standards they should be and so the idea behind the infrastructure institute is really to to, to support nations that are interested in you know maybe doing a bit of a different approach to de developing infrastructure projects to close that gap and to do it in a way that um where nations can assert their their jurisdiction over their their infrastructure so Really, the First Nation Infrastructure Institute, the idea is to be added to the Fiscal Management Act and to work with those other institutes. We're actually uh, fortunate to have the Tax Commission um, located, the head office located in Kamloops, BC, development phase right now. So we, we haven't been established yet, but uh, what we've been doing is developing the framework, the uh, proposed amendments to the Fiscal Management Act that would help establish um, the First Nation Infrastructure Institute. In the meantime, while we're developing those amendments and looking to have it established, 
we have been doing what we call proof of concept projects and we're material uh, the Chippewas of Kettle and Stony Point uh, we're working with some nations in Atlantic Canada the Atlantic First Nations Water Authority and Buckingay First Nation and we have been working with the First Nations Health Authority here in British Columbia and we're working with Stalus to talk about um, some health facilities that could be located there. So today I have a few slides to introduce what Finney is all about. That's what we call it for short, F-N-I-I -I or Finney. Um, to talk about the approach, to talk about the mission, to talk about the work we're doing and how we think. Um, this might be a bit better. So Chris, if we can go to the next slide, um, that would be great. The mission of the uh, of fields and processes to effectively and efficiently infrastructure assets on their lands. And this mission was developed um, with the input and guidance of the Finney Development Board. So we have, uh, we, we, you know, Finney doesn't exist yet. So when it does exist, we uh, see it would be having a board of directors that would provide leadership and guidance. But in, during this development phase, what we do have is uh, leaders from across the country that have stepped forward to provide uh, leadership uh, and guidance. Uh, and they have provided the input to develop a statement. We have uh, actually the chair of our development board is very close to uh, Victoria. Um, Sayo First Nation, former Chief Alan Claxton is our development board chair. Uh, Keith Matthew from uh, First Nation and uh, Sequetmic Territory. Uh, we have Vaughn Paul from uh, the Technical Services Advisory Group in Alberta. Uh, Dallin Barron, Saskatchewan. Chief David Crate in uh, Northern Manitoba, Fisher River Cree. Uh, Jordy K. Capitum um, from Northwestern Ontario, the KO Chief, Chiefs, uh, very remote communities. Uh, Joe Muskokaman from the Chippewas of the Thames in Ontario, and Dana Francis from Tabeek in Atlantic Canada. Um, those are the members of our Finney Development Board, and they they have uh, again provided the input to this mission. I think it is maybe worthwhile noting here that um, in this mission statement we don't actually see the words fund or finance. Uh, that's not to say that we don't think financing a lot, but we want to uh, be very clear about what it is that Finney's doing and what the other fiscal institutions are doing. Um, in the support of nations that are choosing to assert their jurisdiction um, and over their infrastructure projects. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the, in the upcoming slides. So maybe Chris, can we go to the next slide, which talks about the strategic approach. And, uh, you know, this is a First Nation led uh, initiative, similar to the, to the Fiscal Management Act. There are, uh, there's institutions that have been established, I think you've probably heard from some of them in the previous uh, webinars. Um, Finney's gonna be uh, uh, infrastructure focused. Uh, the idea of setting standards with respect to the planning and procurement infrastructure project and reviewing and certifying that those standards have been met. That's the similar idea that you see with the First Nations Financial Management Board, similar idea that you see with the First Nation Tax Commission, setting standards and capacity development for support to meet those standards. Being a center of excellence, um, we hope that nations won't have to do multiple, you know, wastewater treatment plants, for example, in a in a generation, that you build those things uh, once and you have the capacity for them to last for a long life. Um, the downside of that is that you may not have the expertise or the experience of doing those processes multiple times. And, um, you know, having a center of excellence where you can know what the best practices are, where you can avoid the pitfalls, that's, we think that will be helpful. We know that, you know, in provinces, um, there's, there's infrastructure agencies that have been established to support um, infrastructure development, like Partnerships BC, for example, SASC Build uh, Infrastructure. Um, you know, this would be an indigenous, um, you know, center of excellence. And part of the legislation. So this is a key a number of times why do you need to have legislation we think that um, it's important for 
the mandate of the organization to be uh, very clear and established through the legislation and the relationships with the other institutes to be clearly defined in the legislation. So that's the strategic approach. And, and this is the, you know, there it has had some success, this approach, as you may have heard from previous webinars. If we can go to the next slide, uh, Chris. Um, you know, there, there are uh, three institutes that have been established by the Act. The Act was uh, uh, received royal assent in 2005, I believe. And really, the, once the boards were appointed, the institution started operations in 2007. Um, it really is based on a, a model that's probably very familiar to you, which is the BC municipal finance model, um, with the idea being that individual nations that participate in the regime may have tax that they get from their reserves, and they have borrowing requests for infrastructure projects on their lands, and they uh, submit their borrowing requests to the First Nations Finance Authority. The Finance Authority compiles the borrowing requests from the various um, First Nations that are participating and then issues a debenture uh, in, through the capital markets to achieve more favorable borrowing terms. Um, the role of the Tax Commission is to provide some uh, support for a property tax uh, and, it, and there's specific taxation powers provided for in the Fiscal Management Act, including development cost charges, uh, including some fees. Um, the role of the First Nations Financial Management Board is to uh, uh, provide a certification for uh, financial management systems and financial performance. So to become a borrowing member of the First Nations Finance Authority, uh, a participating First Nation is required to have their financial system certified by the FB to make sure that uh, to enhance the credit uh, strength of the borrowing members. So the whole regime is optional, it's not mandatory. Um, at the start, I think when this initiative was being discussed in the early 2000s, there was some thought that, well, this is maybe going to work for a few First Nations. Uh, you know, maybe the Squamishes and the West Banks and the Canadas of the, of the world that have are located uh, close to an urban area that have strategically located lands. What we have found now since uh, the time of the legislation was passed, there's now over 300 First Nations across the country that are participating in, in the Act. And to participate in the Act, uh, the requirement is to pass a band council resolution and to submit that band council resolution to, to Canada. And then the name of the First Nation is added to the schedule to the Act, which is you can find online. So with 300 First Nations across Canada using the tools of the Fiscal Management Act, I guess a frustration uh, maybe, or despite the fact that it, it looks like nations are using a lot of these tools, and in fact, the First Nations Finance Authority has been successful at raising um, a revenue for our capital for First Nations for their projects, but we still have a huge infrastructure gap. And so, um, you know, what are the missing uh, pieces to this puzzle that we can add? What are the missing tools in the toolbox that could be available to uh, First Nations that wish to uh, assert their jurisdiction over infrastructure? This is where the idea for Finney, um, you know, has has really come from. Just uh, so, yeah, maybe we can move on to the next slide, Chris. You know, one one of the uh, things that uh, we found. Uh, as we've been going out and talking about the idea behind uh, Finney and what Finney will do, uh, it was some misperceptions, I think, about, about the role of this organization. And, and since Canada, um, I think a couple of years ago, uh, publicly stated that it was going to be getting out of the business of, of infrastructure on reserve, uh, they have made a, several statements about wanting to have Indigenous organizations assume the responsibility for that because the track record of, of success is, is just not there and the gap has not been closing. And so trying to find a different way to do things, we see some different organizations across the country emerging. 
uh, in BC, there's an organization called the BC Housing and Infrastructure Council. Uh, in Alberta, there's a group of nations that have been talking about assuming responsibility for some infrastructure. In Manitoba, the Southern Chiefs Organization is over 20 First Nations that are looking to assume responsibility for water infrastructure. In Atlantic Canada, we see uh, 20 First Nations in the Atlantic First Nations Water Authority uh, wanting to assume responsibility for water infrastructure. So there are these regional organizations that are emerging uh, uh, and establishing themselves and their roles. They would be similar in a sense to what the First Nations Health Authority is. That is to be assuming responsibility for some things that the government of Canada is currently doing and to enter into a long-term funding agreement, a 10-year funding agreement, to undertake those responsibilities. That is not what Finney's about. So, uh, you know, and it's, we don't think that Finney would be in competition with those bodies. In fact, we think there's a strong complementarity to them. And in fact, we think we need strong Indigenous regional organizations if we're going to be able to close the infrastructure gap. But what Finney is, is, you know, and we described it here, and then again, this was a lot of discussion with our development board, um, a First Nation-led institute to support the use of best practices in planning, procurement, and delivery of projects. Um, you know, a capacity developer of uh, providing technical support, um, you know, a complementary body to the existing First Nation institutions established by the FMA, and supporting the due diligence on monies invested in infrastructure. But Finney's not a funding body, not an engineering architectural firm, not a contractor, not an owner, not a decision maker, uh, and, and not replacing other groups um, or stakeholders. So, um, and I've got some examples that we'll talk about just to describe how we're working together. So maybe, um, Chris, we can go to the next slide. So this slide, um, you know, is looking at establishing a project team. We have um, three projects that we're working on right now, and maybe this is a good place to talk about the examples. Um, in the case of Kettle and Stony Point, um, we have uh, an individual First Nation that is looking to uh, replace and upgrade and expand the service area for a water and wastewater um, system. So in that scenario, we have um, 100 member households that are connected to the system. We have about 400 cottagers that are not connected to the system. And the community has established a comprehensive community plan to um, that identifies a number of priorities, including uh, improving and upgrading the system so that uh, there can be some environmental and public health risks addressed. There's uh, some concerns about the nature of the of this wastewater treatment um, uh, for the cottagers right now. So in this case, we have um, you know people on the project team from the nation, including counselors, including administrators. Any technical team members participated on the project team, and we had some. They had some external advisors that they were um, also bringing into the technical team. And together, you know, we we've worked together to develop, for example, terms of reference for the feasibility study for the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we've worked together to evaluate bids that have come in of feasibility study for the treatment plant. These are not things that happen uh, every day. So reviewing, you know, multiple bids um, and understanding what to look for in the bid package, um, or even the establishing the criteria to evaluate the bids. These are things that the nation was keen to have some support on. Um, another example is uh, how we're working with the First Nations Health Authority and um, with Stalus. So in this case, we have a regional organization that's providing some funding. The First Nations Health Authority is providing some funding for the project. The nation itself has some revenue that it's looking to put towards the project, and Canada is making a contribution. And so 
you know, we, in the project team, we have not only members from Stalus, the, the nation, but also the First Nations Health Authority and Finney. Uh, in the case of the Atlantic Water Authority, similar situation. Uh, we're bringing together some folks from the different organizations to the part of the project team. So I, I think that's maybe a good, uh, a little bit, a good discussion on you know what the organization's meant to be doing, how it's meant to be supporting projects. If we go to the next slide, um, we can talk in a little bit more about the projects we see um, for Finney to uh, work with nations or indigenous organizations to support projects. I know this is a bit of a, a busy slide. Um, it's really, I think about it more in terms of these four steps. Uh, the first step is really identifying the project. The second step or the second row is really about developing a business case for a project. Um, the third uh, row is really about the procurement process, going to find uh, a company uh, or group to work with to develop your project. And fourth and final, the bottom row is really about, you know, construction operations and maintenance. So you can see in the diagram, there's a lot of thought about planning and upfront planning. Um, I think it's maybe a bit misleading, uh, this picture in a sense, because we know that the operation and maintenance and the life cycle and asset management um, periods of time are, are, are very long, or hopefully they're gonna be very long, and there's costs associated there. And so it doesn't really demonstrate that length, but it is a good, it is a helpful picture, I think, just in terms of us describing what it is, what the process is that um, would like to use and the standards that would be set um, to develop projects. So again, I, I know there's maybe sometimes some confusion. What is Finney going to do? Is it going to be setting like, you know, uh, business uh, building codes or water quality standards? No, it's not. Um, really, uh, the idea behind Finney and the standards behind Finney or about the process by which you would do the due diligence to develop your what are part of the country you're in there's there may be appropriate building codes or water quality standards or those things that have already been developed we're not trying to recreate the wheel for those um, but we are what we are trying to do I think is support nations that choose to work with Finney to develop the business case for their project and that business case needs to think through not only the construction costs for the project, but also the operating and maintenance costs. So I kind of spend a little, I know we've got still a fair bit of time and I want to spend a little bit more time just talking through some of the different pieces um, on this picture. Uh, you know, really we're, working with in these proof of concept projects on the business case for the projects. If you get a chance, if you're working, um, I really do recommend going to check out the Finney webpage. There is a publications and resources section on the webpage as I'm just looking at now. And um, there's some templates and, and documents that are kind of, that can be helpful to uh, provide a little bit more information about our thinking on some of these things. Um, you know, one of the, Things that we have been suggesting is that uh, when we're identifying the project and putting together a project team, that a project charter would be something that would be helpful. And there is actually on the Finney uh, webpage, there's a, a sort of outline of what some things that could go in the project charter. Uh, you know, things like, well, who, who's going to be on the team, of course. Um, uh, what are the, you know, principles by which you're going to uh, you know, guide the relationship that you're going to work together in a respectful manner, promote delivery of projects, accountability and transparency, um, the governance of the, of the project, uh, the decision making process of the project, the roles and responsibilities, some of the uh, steps that you expect to go through and the time frames, um, a conflict of interest provision. So some of those things are, we think, should go into a project charter and Spending a bit of time thinking through those things will help uh, the process uh, as we move through it. 
so if I was thinking about, well, how is this penny going to work? The nation's going to say, uh, well, first of all, because it's optional, just like the rest of the Fiscal Management Act, a nation would uh, indicate that they would like to work with Finney, um, establish the project team, work collaboratively to develop a project charter, and then there could be a case where the nation says, well, I want to make sure I have all the right things in this project charter. Can we review it against the Finney standards? And, and there could be a review you know, in terms of developing the business case, um, do we have all the things that we need to have in the business case? Have we covered them? Have we done all the due diligence we need to do um, to put this project forward and to, and to make it work? And again, similarly, uh, I would encourage you if you have time to check out the business case outline, the, you know, the strategic case, it's really the why. Uh, the why. Why are we doing the project? And uh, I know in some cases, the way the system currently works, where nations are heavily dependent on federal funding, they may be really doing projects that have funding available, but not necessarily projects that are community priorities. And so what we're hoping is with uh, this approach, with using the tools of the Fiscal Management Act, being able to use some of uh, their own local revenues for the project, that nations will be able to really um, develop projects that meet their own community priorities. Those are things that could be set out in something like a comprehensive community plan, uh, could be set out as part of a multi-year financial plan, could be identified in a land use plan, could be identified in a capital plan. You know, these are things that some nations may have portions of done or but maybe don't have all of those pieces in place. As you've heard from other organizations like the you know the land management initiative or the first nations financial management board um, nations are starting to develop or have developed different parts of those plans and bringing them together and, and linking them strongly to the business case we think is important um, the economic case really about the um, you know probably everyone's familiar with the feasibility studies that get done and this is where we see the feasibility study fitting as in the economic case. Um, you know, uh, what would be some of the things that would be touched on there? Well, what, where, what are the location options for this project? Uh, what are the technical options uh, for the project? Uh, what are the costs, the indicative costs for the project? So, for example, with Kettle and Stony Point, um, we have been working with them on a wastewater treatment uh, plant feasibility study. And we did look at various locations and there was evaluations of the locations and different ways to treat uh, the wastewater. And, um, and coming to the point of how, where will the connections be and what will be the timing of the connections uh, to the wastewater treatment plant and what are the costs associated with those. The commercial case um, is is really about procurement, and uh, again, I you know we think that uh, the current the way the current system is services Canada it, communities uh, some communities are are dependent on Indigenous Services Canada funding. Uh, the process to use the funding from from Indigenous Services has a certain procurement approach. The design bid build approach is typically the approach that is used. Um, and th that may well be the way to procure a project, but uh, we think in, in this process, in the Finney process, that there should be an evaluation of different procurement approaches. And we know that some nations have tried different approaches. They've tried design build approaches, or they've tried construction management approaches. There's a whole list of alphabet soup acronyms of different ways to procure projects and really manage the risk associated with the construction and could be the operation and maintenance of the project depending on the way it is procured. And so certainly this is a key area we think for Finney is um, to look at the list of procurement options, to talk about the advantages and the disadvantages of uh, to do an evaluation 
of the options and see which one may be most relevant for this particular project. And um, yeah, to uh, really um, come to some the project will be procured. Like why is this important? Well, we think it's really important in terms of risk management. We think there could be improved uh, management costs. Um, there could be improved quality of the project. There's a number of uh, outcomes that we think could be improved as a result of uh, procurement. The financial case, um, of course, is a key part. I know I said at the outset that finance and funding wasn't in the mission. And I said, that's not to say that we don't think about it. We're going to be thinking about it a lot. And we are thinking about it a lot. The financial plan for the project. Um, the key, you know, one of the reasons of being part of the Fiscal Management Act is, is being able to use, we think there's a value of being able to use all of the tools of the Fiscal Management Act. And that's the access to capital through the First Nation Finance Authority. That's uh, asserting uh, jurisdiction over local revenues on your lands and, and raising local revenues and improve financial management. And so all those are brought to bear in the financial case and um, you know matching up uh, the costs to the to the revenues. So making sure that we, we know these things don't always happen at the same time, that using financing tools to be able to match up the revenues to the costs is part of this. So I think it is a really exciting part. We see we again having 300 nations that are uh, part of the Fiscal Management Act already, um, maybe uh, raising their own revenue, wanting to do innovative things to find solutions to build projects that meet their own priorities is very very exciting. I think, um, and and we are you know to, talking to uh, and hearing from nations that are. Uh, saying we want to we want to use these tools so uh, that includes again you know property tax uh, but also something called a service tax which uh, is very closely linked to um, to uh, the development or, impro or improvements to infrastructure and there's actually a case study of a KISS Connect First Nation uh, Tanaka territory in, in British Columbia where uh, there was improvements to water infrastructure and then that improvement was linked to a specific service tax where the cost of those improvements are amortized over a period of time and paid through that service tax and once those improvements are paid then then th that tax falls away so uh, development cost charges again a one-time charge um, uh, fees there's ongoing fees service fees that can be charged there are some tools in the act that are quite helpful um, and that, of course, we see, you know, local governments in British Columbia or other parts of the country use these tools to be able to pay for the costs of infrastructure. We're not suggesting that Canada is off the hook for funding. Um, we think there's a strong role for Canada to play there. Just acknowledging that nations want to have their own tools as well. And certainly, Canada fund have a more diversified uh, you know, uh, base, a more sustainable and diversified economy, local economy would mean not just members, but also economic development activities. Um, I should say one of the other, I think, interesting things uh, that's being discussed is the idea of monetized transfers. So, you know, a reasonable question is, well, it's fine for a nation that has its own revenue that can finance things, but what about the nations that simply don't have their own revenue? They don't have the opportunity to charge taxation to a to a lessee uh, you know whether it's a, a, a retail shopping center a gas station a, a business whatever that that lessee is um, the idea behind the monetized transfer is really if a nation uh, had a long-term transfer agreement with Canada would the nation be able to go to the First Nations Finance Authority and say well we're going to have this transfer coming in over the next x number of years and based on that long-term predictable revenue stream, um, we would like to borrow some money today to pay for this project. This is an idea that's been discussed, I think, for some time. I know the Finance Authority uh, is, is very keen to, to support this approach. And uh, we know that uh, the Government of Canada has some concerns about risk management uh, with respect to that. 
um, you know, if, the, if there is a long-term transfer agreement in place, what certainty is there that the project's going to get built, get com completed? Uh, what certainty is there that the project's going to be, be completed on time and on budget? And is it going to last? Because the last thing they want is to have this financial transaction in place and the assets either be incomplete or is not no longer working and there's still this ongoing obligation to pay for this um, transfer. So, you know, this is why I think we think there's a real opportunity for Finney to support, uh, you know, rigorous due diligence and project plans and business cases that are developed to a, to a standard to which those risks can be effectively managed. In terms of the management case, um, you know, there's a strong, what we've heard from nations, there's a strong desire to, um, to participate in projects, to build capacity, uh, to be operators of projects. Um, and although there's the desire to do that, there, there may not be the capacity today, but how can we build that management uh, capacity uh, over time? And again, the, the management case is an important part I think for not only uh, you know engagement of the community over time about incorporating their input into the project, but also building capacity and, and local management. Man, that's a lot. I it's um, it's a bit odd because I can't see anyone on the other side of this. It looks like people are still hanging in there. So I feel like I've been talking for a long time now, but. Uh, Hopefully everyone's uh, following along that, you know, again, the idea I think uh, behind the project ID and the business case is we would get to the end of the business case um, and a nation would say, okay, we developed this business case. We'd like to have it reviewed uh, to, to make sure it has all the right things in it. And so it's not a case of Finney saying whether, um, you know, it's a good project, like it's the right project or it's a, uh, you know the right um, procurement model. The question is, have you done? Have you gone through the right process? Have you considered your options? Have you come to the conclusion um, and built consensus around how you're going to approach this? And have you at least considered all of these things in your business case? And so we would see, you know, at the end of the business case phase, a review uh, to make sure it it had it was complete. And um, once it was complete. Finney could issue a certificate um, to say this business case has considered all the appropriate uh, things in it. And I, I've just gone through a list of some of them. I think, uh, you know, as Finney develops, the standards to which it will certify things will be developed in, in more detail. Um, but generally, you know, speaking, these are the aspects of the business case we think are important. Why are you doing the project, the strategic case? what you know the feasibility of the project the economic case the procurement options analysis in the commercial case a financial model that looks not only at the, the cost of construction but also operation and maintenance the financial case and matching revenues up to those and how the ongoing management of the project is going to work all those things should be incorporated into the business case and once that's uh complete, uh, we think that's important, an important signal for who? Well, I, th I think it's an important signal for members to know that um, that the leadership of the nation is undertaking the work, is doing the due diligence required to build a project that's going to work for the community, that's going to be quality services. Uh, we think that will be an important signal to, um, to lenders. Uh, who may be interested in in lending for the project that you know there's there's all the due diligence that's been done uh, funders it'll be important for uh, you know if government Canada is providing funding what about regional indigenous organizations that have limited you know, all, all budget you know budget constraints and uh, they want to make sure that the projects going ahead in a good way uh, and going on to the next phase I think this is important for companies that may be interested in bidding on the project. Um, having a proper business case will hopefully um, instill confidence in companies that, you know, the funding's lined up, the project's uh, been well thought out, um, and there's a procurement process that's going to go ahead. It's going to be a fair and transparent procurement process. It's going to result in a decision being made. 
and it's going to go ahead in a timely fashion. And with that kind of confidence, we would hope that there would be more competition. There would be more firms interested in competing for the work. And with more firms competing for the work, we would hope there would be better value um, for the nation and for the members in terms of the, and, and for the residents, whether they're businesses or, uh, you know, or residents, uh, non-member residents who are living uh, on the land. So, um, yeah, the procurement phase, uh, I know we, we haven't, you know, we're still in the planning process for the proof of concept projects that we're working on, but we know that the development of procurement documents, tender documents, is is a significant work. And so having, I guess, similar to the way that the tax commission and the financial management, we think that um, some tools and templates with respect to the procurement would be very helpful. And that's something that Finney would also be. And then, yeah, certainly last but not least on this picture, I spent a lot of time talking about this picture, but there's a lot in here, I think. Um, you know, construction, operation, uh, we know that that operation phase is, you know, we want it to be extending the life of the asset and it's going to be over a longer period of time. And I've uh, certainly had a lot of interest from nations that we've been talking to about assuming responsibility for asset management uh, and, and also uh, data management with respect to their product. I think there's more work to do to be thinking through that last row, but uh, uh, do you want to make the comment that we are thinking about the entire life cycle? So I think that's quite a lot on that one picture. Um, maybe if we could go to the next slide. The next slide is um, talking about a few scenarios and yeah, one, one of the questions we had was, uh, you know, are you, how are you going to respond to different nations or different organizations in different circumstances? Maybe there are some nations or groups that have a lot of experience that have their own way of doing things and they're not looking for a lot of support, but they still believe there's value in having a project certified by project plan certified by Finney. And again, it's project based, right? It's not, it's not, it's not certifying the nation, it's certifying this project business case. Um, so, you know, in, in that situation, we can see, and again, the idea behind this picture is really showing three different nations. These are the three scenarios or three groups. It doesn't have to be, it could be a, not an Indian Act band. It could be a, a regional organization, it could be a tribal council, could be a not-for-profit society established by multiple nations to govern some sort of health infrastructure. Whatever that group is, um, they may be looking to Finney for types of support. And on the left-hand side, we see the types of support that Finney could provide. Well, for the one is certifying project plans against those standards. Uh, you know, there's a little bit more details, maybe providing some tools and templates, samples, guides to support the nation as it uh, develops its project and and a lot of support really participating on project teams. So, you know, on the on the left hand side, we see a nation that's doesn't isn't looking for a lot of support. And on the right hand side, we've got a situation where the nation's looking for more support. And and so it's really up to the nation to decide how involved they or what kind of support I think they would be looking for uh, from Finney. And again, I think we can look to the experience of the other Fiscal Management Act institutions to see how they respond um, to, you know, to nations that are wanting to work with them. I've just got a couple more slides. I really appreciate everyone hanging on throughout this. Um, if we go to the next uh, slide, it's actually kind of a little bit more interesting, maybe a sample funding model. Um, who, there was a lot of, as I mentioned, like confusion about what's Finney's role and, and how will the funding work. We got asked this question a lot. And um, so we thought it might be helpful to have a, a scenario. I think there's many different scenarios. This is by no means, uh, doesn't have to be like this. Um, but it, I think it's interesting to think through this picture and then you can think of all these different permutations or different scenarios that might work. 
um, in this picture on the in the middle of it is the First Nation. Um, and you can see we, we have, you know, it could be multiple First Nations working together. I think that's an, I haven't really mentioned that too much, the idea of bundling. Um, but if you had, uh, you know, perhaps several communities within the same nation, uh, several nations with, that are participating in a tribal council together, they were pursuing projects of a similar nature, would you be able to procure multiple projects under a single procurement? This is the idea behind bundling. Uh, see, it's sort of a, gets mentioned a lot, I think, with the possible solutions for closing in, the infrastructure gap. Seems like it's probably more complicated than it sounds um, in terms of how you bundle things together in the decision-making process. But the reason we have the S and the brackets there is because we do think there could be the potential for multiple nations working together. Um, just above it, you can see, of course, the infrastructure project could be a uh, water system uh, we're really concentrating i think on um, community infrastructure projects uh could be a health facility um, community building uh, high-speed internet infrastructure project it is on the left hand side we have um, some funding sources and uh, again these are this is not an exhaustive list but um one uh funding source we see a lot is the federal fiscal transfer. So that would be funding from Indigenous Services Canada, and they have a group uh, that, uh, that provides funding for projects. They have certain priorities that they fund. Um, essentially what happens is the, um, the budget for capital projects is allocated out to the regional offices. So, and then the regional offices make allocations. So for example, in British Columbia, the regional office would have a certain to um, allocate to projects in a given year. Of course, the demand for funding is much higher than the funding available. So there tends to be a, a, a backlog of, of people wanting to get their projects done. But this is the one source of funding that could be possible. In addition, we see on the left hand side uh, local and other revenue. Believe it or not, these are technical terms. Um, local revenue is defined as in the first nations fiscal management act and other revenue is uh, defined in a regulation to the act so that could be things like um, uh, revenue from impact benefit agreements for example could be um, i know of a nation in bc that has negotiated a reconciliation agreement with british columbia that reconciliation agreement uh, consists of some lands that they are reacquiring and also cash that's being paid out over a period of 10 years or so. And so the cash that's getting paid out is being to a trust. The trust is earning income and the nation's then able to use the income for the purposes that have been established through the trust. So when we think about other revenues, um, certainly think about the potential for the nations to uh, use those revenues and go to the First Nations Finance Authority and get a loan today based on the revenues that they're going to be collecting in the future. So that's again a real, I think, a real key part of this whole picture. And uh, we can see in the, you know, in this scenario again, uh, the Financial Management Board is certifying the financial management of the nation. The Tax Commission is providing um, support in terms of local revenue laws. And then the role of Finney, really supporting the nation and developing its project, developing the business case, supporting the procurement of the project. So hopefully that provides a little bit um, of context, just of once, and again, you know, could there be different scenarios? Uh, like, could you have a box on the left-hand side where the First Nations Health Authority is providing some funding to the nation for funding? Absolutely. Could we have uh, different ways that the, the the loans and the money flowing, absolutely. Uh, this was just, I think, one scenario that we thought would be uh, one that would uh, be familiar to, to nations and, and be one of interest to nations. So that I, I'm coming to the end here, um, and I just I just have one more slide, really, which is 
just talking about workshops, we have been doing some, we did some webinars that are on our web page. You can have a look at there too. And um, we have been doing workshops um, certainly around some of these ideas. And uh, there's no shortage of, of good ideas for projects. I think that's one of the exciting parts of working with Finney is um, the real enthusiasm and excitement that communities have, that people have to improve the infrastructure in their community. I, I, I sort of say to Manny and uh, others at the Financial Management Board that they, they have such a hard job going talking about tax, talking about strong financial management. These are kind of abstract terms or even terms that people are, you know, there's, con there's controversy, but when you talk about improving infrastructure projects, people are always really positive and really enthusiastic. And so, um, you know, we're hopeful that uh, in the coming months, um, we're expecting a memorandum to cabinet in the fall with uh, some policy objectives for establishing Finney through an amendment to the Fiscal Management Act. And after the memorandum to cabinet, we would hope that uh, legislation would be introduced in the winter and uh, that Finney would be established and that we will be able to respond to, you know, nations and uh, Indigenous groups across the country to support them to close the infrastructure gap. So thank you so much for being patient and taking the time to listen today and certainly be happy to respond to questions that you may have. Jason, thank you very much for your presentation. Over the first comments, we've just had a lot of uh, a lot of our public servant colleagues have just wanted to show their appreciation for this seminar, and they've really felt that it's really helped their understanding. And maybe to start off with the first question that we have is that um, this is a more general question to public servants, and it's really about advice. And so the question from Genevieve Patterson is that, um, would you have advice for public servants in developing meaningful partnerships with First Nations? Um, yeah, that's, I mean, sorry, just, the, uh, just can you say that the question again? Advice for yes. public servants who are wanting to develop good relationships? Yes, to develop meaningful partnerships with First Nations. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, our, our approach, I think, with uh, with Finney has been to, well, to reach out to communities, to try and describe some of the objectives that we've been talking about, um, are just reflecting on how we've developed the relationships that we have with the nations that we're working with so far. Um, you know, and, and it's been really an iterative process, uh, but, but uh, talking about the objectives, uh, trying to listen as best we can to the work that they have done, to what their objectives are, to understanding how we can support, um, you know, their project, um, reporting regularly with political leadership, um, as well as including uh, people from the administrative uh, different departments. So again, going back to that project team slide, when I think about how we've been working with um, communities on the project it's been from lots of different parts of the organization so it's it's not just meeting with the counselor it's the counselor it's the band manager it's the person from finance who's been participating it's the person from the property tax side it's the person who was involved in the comprehensive community planning process it's the actual water plant operators two guys who are community members who are you know, really invested, like I would say, emotionally invested in their in their career uh, as, as providing that service to their community members and talking, you know, about what are these options and and what are the impacts and and really being collaborative and inclusive. I think has been an objective, including. Uh, and I go back to the times before COVID when we could actually see people in person. And we were having community engagement sessions to say, we're starting this process. We want to hear from you about what your thoughts are about, you know, the procurement options. And, and we said the word procurement about four times in our presentation, thinking that we we're pretty smart. And then uh, 
one of the elders, who's former chief, who was at the meeting, got up and asked, waved over the microphone and said, what the hell is procurement anyway? <laughs> so we, we, we realized, yeah, just uh, we needed to get communicate and, and communicate in, in language that was understandable and, uh, and make those efforts. And it's, it takes time, that's for sure. Great, thank you, Jason. Um, another question when this is really comes about the funding models, and I know I know that um, all the the organizations under the FMA have actually have these broad engagements. So the question is really: Has there been any discussion of the PPP model, the public-private partnerships, and how would this actually work into the work that you've shown? Yeah, interesting. Um, so some of the people who are on our technical team do have expertise with uh, P3s, public-private partnerships. I know for some people that's uh, that's a bad bad word. Um, some people it's polarizing approach, um, and I would say that um, you know I think our approach and our discussion is open to that possibility when we talk about the different procurement models. If we had something that considered the design and the build, the financing, the operation, the maintenance, you're entering a realm where you're thinking about something that sounds and looks like a public-private partnership. Um, one of the, I think, arguments against using this type of an approach with First Nation projects has been the argument that First Nation projects are just too small that the transaction costs associated with the P3 model is significant and doesn't is not justified in the use on projects that are, you know, 20 to 50 million dollars. Um, you know, so I mentioned a, a water wastewater project, you know, that's that's the sort of realm of the project size that we're talking about, like 20 to 50. It's not it's not insignificant. That's a big it's a lot of money. Um, but in terms of infrastructure project size, you tend to see larger projects than that that use that. Having said that, again, you know, we think the rigor that we're bringing from the procurement options analysis, from the planning, um, is is really, um, you know, building on that experience of the P3. And I know, um, you know, one of our advisors, um, some of you, some may have met him, uh, Tim Philpotts, who is the head of the infrastructure program at EY and who's based out of Vancouver here um, you know he says P3s should really be planning planning and planning like that's what you know it's it's the rigor of the planning so um, again not to say that uh, in terms of a funding model is not possible in fact we think this is gonna you know where where it makes sense you know applying these concepts will will en en enable that to happen uh, um, and certainly when I mentioned, you know, multiple projects, bundling projects and regional organizations, maybe there's an opportunity, uh, more opportunity to use that kind of a model in those circumstances. Um, yeah, and the other, you know, of course, interesting stuff that's been happening lately, like the Canada Infrastructure Bank discussions and announcement about the program they have. You know, I didn't have that in the financial, the funding model scenario I had there, but uh, certainly uh, it seems like it would be reasonable to be looking at all funder, funder options. Um, and then of course, the announcements in the federal budget about investments into infrastructure and shovel. Using this kind of approach is going to help you get your project shovel ready. So, Great. Thank you very much. And once again, I'd like the, to thank uh, Stephen McComb for this question. The next question I would actually like to raise is from Sabrina Demert, who's quite curious about the relationship between Indigenous Services Canada and Finney. And her question is that um, would Finney approaches be able to be used if ISC is still providing funding, or would seeking infrastructure upgrades through ISC programs exclude nations from participating? in F FMA and using these tools. So once again, it's really a discussion. What is basically the interface of ISC or other federal agencies with FINI? 
Yeah, great question. Um, and, and it's not, they're not exclusive. So if you choose to work with Finney, it doesn't mean you're choosing not to work with ISC. In other words, we would see a project where there would be a contribution from ISC, there would be a contribution from the nation potentially. You know, like I, one of the things that I see anyway, like, or a perspective that I have is that when you come onto reserve, well, first of all, it's a different world because now all of a sudden provincial laws of general application don't apply. We're on federal land. There's different rules. And, and so what are the rules for infrastructure? Well, um, you know, Canada basically funds certain things, but they tend to fund uh, 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 things that support member services. So water for systems, for example, roads, for example, schools, for example. Um, and they, they provide the funding. Um, and then we have maybe, you know, on the, this other part of the reserve, there's some economic development. Well, ISC is not going to want to fund the economic development. Why? There's a maybe um, confusing reasons and people who have different opinions about what the reasons are. The fact is, ISC tends not to fund economic development. They tend to fund members. So now what do we have? We have like these two worlds that should be in some cases connected to one infrastructure system. Why would you build two separate systems to serve members and non-members? It seems to make more sense to have a one system that, that serves both, but to have a fair and equitable allocation of the costs. Uh, you know, then, then you come to the question, well, how are we gonna develop a fair and equitable allocation of costs for members and non-members? You know, are we doing using water meters? Like, how are we doing this? And certainly, there's but there's ways to do it. It seems, but but it makes sense to me that, that you know a continuing role for them to fund could be straight from ISC from the regional office. Could end up being a regional indigenous organization if we looked five years into the future, ten years into the future. We we know that Canada says they want to get out of the business of funding infrastructure. They want to hand over the responsibility for that to regional organizations. We could see something like the First Nations Health Authority, but it could be an infrastructure authority or a housing and infrastructure authority. That's exactly what the Housing and Infrastructure Council is looking at doing. Um, so there could be a role for funding there, but then also we would see probably and hopefully a more diversified a more balanced view, which is generating some of its own revenue from activities on its land. There's a contribution from ISC, and we've developed using the tools of the Fiscal Management Act, we're able to, and building a business case, we're able to demonstrate that in fact there is a fair and equitable allocation of the costs, and that leads to a more sustainable infrastructure system overall. So, sorry, that's a bit long winded, but no, let's that address it. I mean, that's that's very interesting answer because we have a follow-up question that's actually a bit more expansive but on the same theme um and this is really about more the relationship with it could be the province the relationship it could be with um a, a municipality or a regional district so that this um and robert livingston has asked the question that the services that you're providing for first nations are very similar to those that infrastructure BC provides the public sector project owners. And do you ever engage with infrastructure BC, BC to share best practices? And as, do you see opportunities how both agencies could collaborate when we're actually talking about these larger infrastructure developments that benefit a number of communities? It sounds like a fantastic idea, 100%. I, I, you know, we're, we don't exist yet. We're in a development phase. I, I know we say we want to do things in a different way. I think probably people who are familiar with infrastructure would say, this isn't really that different. This is just a sensible way to do infrastructure. Um, and I think we would agree. Uh, it's just that, you know, we're stuck with the Indian Act uh, in most cases, um, or for those nations that have opted out or opted to use parts of the Fiscal Management Act, um, you know, there's some some powers there, and we're just trying to, yeah, trying to create the structures to be able to use tools similar to what exactly like you say, like what regional districts do, what municipalities do, 
we know that it, you, even those governments get support from, like you say, from uh, you know the provincial government and maybe from other uh, best practices. And so we would hope that Vinny would be su supporting some of that kind of a role. And where where possible, I mean, I'm sitting here in um, you know on a Squamish Nation Reserve in North Vancouver. There's three of them, and there's three local governments. And we know the, um, you know, wastewater treatment plant for the North Shore is being redone. And these are complicated things when you get a whole bunch of people in close area. Um, you know, it's interesting going to different parts of the country, like when we're working with Kettle and Stony Point, you know, it, it's a drive out from town to get to Kettle and Stony Point. Um, for, you know, and, and in some places, it's more like that, where the nation is sort of on its almost on its own. And in BC, I feel like there's many opportunities located, uh, you know, uh, and, and municipalities or regional districts, there's potential for collaboration there. Uh, and I, you know, not to make sweeping generalizations, but um, I, I, anyways, I'm just agreeing with the point. I think there is a, an opportunity to collaborate. I think it would make a lot of sense. And, um, you know, hopefully, the tools that we're hoping, trying to develop here for First Nations, yeah, provide them with the tools in the toolbox so when they come to the table to talk to regional districts or municipalities, they have these tools to be able to engage in a discussion. Jason, thank you. That's a really rich answer. And we certainly have colleagues who are inspired and I can see that, you know, Jeanine Manji is similarly inspired and she's saying, well, She's asking, will you provide tools to support change management and communications planning, as well as to help implement the project? Yeah, that... uh, yeah certainly. Um, you know, uh, again, we're in a in a development phase, trying to think this through. But uh, you know, what are the tools and templates and supports that are going to be required through that management case that I was talking about? Um, and that management case, I think covers again the whole of life so it covers it should cover from you know the planning of the project and the community engagement and the engagement of the different administrative departments and the engagement of the operators of the infrastructure it should uh you know cover the management and the support and capacity development required through to picking a partner to work with to deliver the project to build it um, and we think it should also cover once the building is once the the uh, project operational, the the operations and the maintenance. And so, uh, you know, what do we see in other parts of the country? Maybe on bigger infrastructure projects, like um, you may have heard of these long linear infrastructure projects, um, Wate Power, Clean Show All Season Road. Um, in, in other parts of the country where there's ind indigenous groups that are participating, multiple groups participating on a project and built into, embedded into the procurement and into the business case are requirements for capacity development and requirements for participation. And so I, I would think, and I, like, I, I don't have, we don't have anything specifically on, on change management at the moment, but I would argue that, you know, the, those things should be considered in the management case. Thank you. And a very similar question from Mark Imus, and this is actually more about the broader picture of Finney and other institutions. And so would Finney have any specific, have any specifications around governance such as land code or play a role in assisting First Nations in developing key policies, governance that can facilitate infrastructure development or is this really more the tie-in with some of the other agencies that have developed under the the FMA or the or the Land Management Act? That's, a, that's an interesting question, and we're actually dealing with this issue specifically when we're working in Atlantic Canada. Um, the Atlantic Water Authority, as I mentioned, there I think there was 25 nations that were interested and have been engaged in discussions. I think 15 have committed to participate. There's the potential for more to join. But so we have different First Nations that are going to be part of this new organization that's in a transition phase. 
it's much the same as the First Nations Health Authority had a transition phase and then it became operational. Um, out of those 15 nations, some of them have land code. Some of them operate under the Indian Act. Some of them have developed, some of them have been added to the schedule of the First Nations Fiscal Management Act. Some have not. Some have local revenue laws and are doing property tax. Some do not. Some have sales tax agreements. This is actually a, an interesting thing that I, I didn't talk too much about the budget, but as part of the federal budget, one of the, I think, really interesting things and positive aspects was that nations that have uh, entered into a tax collection agreement with Canada to collect sales tax, whether it's 3 product or the FNGST, they weren't able to use that revenue to pledge towards a loan for the FNFA. I, I'm not sure what the argument was at the time, but as part of this recent budget, nations that do have that sales tax agreement, they're going to be able to use that uh, to finance loans through the FNFA. It's like a huge deal, I think. Um, not not a very exciting like, like terminology in the you know, there's no money like as a result of it, but that power will enable more nations to have borrowing room to be able to um you know do their do their projects so um so yeah so you know again sorry i'm getting off track a little bit here but pretty we've got multiple nations with all these different baskets and decisions they made about their path forward about what powers their government's going to have and as finney i think we need to be able to respond to, to the unique circumstance of a nation so it's up to them to decide whether they think land code is a good idea or not. Um, but does that mean they should still do a business? I think it, we think it does. Um, you know, if they have a land code, could that help them in some ways? I think it probably could. Um, you know, maybe you can still do stuff under the Indian Act. And, uh, you know, I guess similarly, like what about treaty nations, modern treaty nations? Uh, Tlaam and Monolf, um, you know, they have established their path through their treaty. Um, how is it that they're going to develop their business case and how will they bring to bear their powers as a government to be able to raise revenue to um, support their business case? I think for the Finney perspective, you know, we, we're not suggesting any which way is the best way of uh, figuring your, out your path. All I think what we would be doing is trying to understand the powers that that Indigenous group has and how they could be brought to bear to build a solid business case for a project. We're, we're getting such great that, questions upon the answers you're providing, Jason. So I apologize to my colleagues if I seem to be sort of going off, but I think there's some really helpful discussions that are arising. And we actually have a, a follow-on question from Curtis Matias from the Ministry of Finance. And he says, as someone who's working in consumer tax policy, says Finney is something that seems far away from my work, but he's also, he's curious if Finney would be, in, would be involved in helping nations develop tax sharing agreements, or at least the specter of a Finney opportunity would help develop a tax sharing agreement, such as the one that, that the have Cowichan have with their tobacco taxes. And as he says, he feels this is an uh, an area that nations may need more help in navigating the system to enable them to get the funds via tax sharing agreements. Yeah, so interesting stuff. I mean, you know, uh, if we went back, are you able to go back? Actually, um, and the reason I say that is um, uh, it just shows the four fiscal institutions that are part of the Fiscal Management Act. Um, so the, again, the, you know, there's the financial management board, FMB, um, its role is to, uh, support nations that want to improve their financial management and it provides services to do that. It provides, um, you know, tools, uh, policy and procedures to establish your, it talks about the things you should have as part of your financial management system, the standards, um, the tax commission uh, has a separate role and it sets standards with respect to taxation. Um, 
and supports nations with tools and templates and sample laws um, to, to do so. So I, I would think, you know, that that rule of uh, tax sharing agreements would, and I recognize the provincial tax sharing agreement is a different thing than a federal one. I think it's relatively, there's not, maybe not as many provincial ones um, at the moment, but I think it would be great, like, if there was more like that, because exactly like you say, like, if, you know, if, if there was um, more tax collection agreements, coordination agreements, that means that government's going to have revenue streams of its own. Having more revenue streams of its own provides it with, I think, more um, ability to uh, manage and assert its jurisdiction over its infrastructure and to to manage it in a good way. So uh, I'm just not sure that would be Finney's role, right? So it's, it's you know, I'm not, it is a bit, I think we, as we develop Finney, we need to be thinking that, that these things are all connected and there's, um, you know, once we start talking about the project, we immediately talk about the financing and the, and the revenues. And But I think, you know, we want to be mindful of the way the structure has been established through the act here. Thank you, Jason. And uh, before I continue, I'd first like to turn it over to my uh, colleague, Chris Bichard. Chris, I realize I jumped the gun a bit and you did have some questions that you wanted to uh, pose to Jason. Chris? Okay, thank you, Greg. Just getting online here. Um, Jason, I had kind of a, a more general level question. And, and that being that one of the enduring themes in our speaker series has been the power of indigenous led institutions to make significant change in improving the lives of indigenous peoples. And I'm wondering if you could speak to the importance of these kinds of institutions. Why are they so effective? And how government agencies, and you may have touched on this one already, but how we can best work with these institutions in pursuing reconciliation. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Like, I, you know, I, I don't think anybody at the outset, we thought this was a good idea. I mean, again, I reflect on the fact that it's really, if you look at this model, it's really based on the BC municipal finance model. And um, the structure that's been established has been incredibly successful for the province, um, you know, through the MFA, as, at least as I understand it. I'm sure there's challenges like, like with everything, but um, to be able to achieve favorable boring for small and large communities alike is is quite an achievement uh, and the support for them and i think this structure has worked well um for uh you know for first nations and they are they clearly have seen the advantages of doing that um you know being optional like was that part of it being uh of course first nation led i think is an important part of, like of being able to respond and have uh you know i, I think there's still challenges like i you know, the way that the, the organizations are, the, the appointment process is, there's been challenges, just the timeliness of it, getting people um, on there. I know for, um, you know, we talked about it with respect to Finney, like what are some of the challenges that those organizations have uh, been frustrated with and how can we address them as we establish Finney and its governance structure? Um, and I reflect too on the governance structure and the extensive efforts that were made with the First Nations Health Authority and how, you know, they've separated politics and business and uh, the, the way the Health Council appoints members to the board. Um, the board structure looked like for Finney, like, um, I, I think we would want to have in you know, the way that we see it working, um, you know, reviewing business cases and uh, uh, against standards, I think we want to have some real specific skill sets um, to be able to have that good leadership. So we want to have engineering and technical expertise. You know, we want to have financing uh, expertise. We want to have procurement expertise on the board level. Um, does that mean it's um, First Nation people that could be uh, on the board? It, it very well sh could be. Uh, does that mean it's First Nation people who are doing the selecting of who's on the board and the taking off of who's on the board? So it's still controlled. But we want, we just want to make sure that those core competencies are reflected um, on the board. So, you know, like why are they successful? I think I think uh, you know the overall structure has worked. The leadership 
uh, has been good. The uh, benefits have been significant in terms of the the favorable boring rates compared to what what they perhaps were otherwise. And so the idea of going and making the effort of improving financial management systems of of implementing tax laws, these are all justified in the benefits that communities are are seeing. I, I do think there's a huge opportunity for BC here. Um, you know, I often in like meetings when I'm not meeting with people from BC, I li they literally tell me like, don't say it's from BC. We don't want to hear any more about everything's from BC. <laughs> but the truth is the financial management board is located at the Cap Capilano Reserve, the finance authorities at West Bank and the tax commissions in Kamloops. So we've got three of these organizations based in, in BC. Um, out of the, you know, out of the, what, 200 First Nations, I know that's not the exact number, but how many of the, those nations in BC have chosen to actually use the services of the institutions and participate in the act? It's pretty high. Hmm. Like, I think it's maybe at least half or more. I'm not sure what the exact number is. Um, and that's what I've been saying to the First Nations Health Authority is, guys, look, we've got like 100 nations here half of the nations that you're working with who are using these tools and if they're using the tools maybe you can leverage better the investments that you're making as an organization um, into the project so i would say you know similarly for bc if we have nations that are using these tools um, if bc is you know reaching agreements or thinking like you say a tax collection agreement is it just bc alone or are we understanding that there's other tools that are at play here and that you can have a much bigger impact um, you know, and, and, and maybe th like, again, the sales tax is a great example. Like, is it, is it just that sales tax or is it actually even leveraging it through the finance authority, you know, and, and how, and again, the importance of the nature of the sales coordination agreement and the predictability and the certainty of it into the future so that that nation is able to borrow on the if it's going to be sold next week, it's going to be problematic. But if there's more certainty with respect to the nature of that revenue stream, and I know we can't predict, you know, economic shocks, but you know, it, if it can be just taken away at a moment's notice, that's not going to lend a lot of, uh, I guess, strength or instill confidence, you know, in that revenue stream. So, so I think there's opportunity though, real, real good opportunity. Thanks, Jason. Um, our time is quickly winding down here, so I wanted to take an opportunity to thank you for an excellent presentation. You've given us a strong sense of the Institute's mission, its operating context, and how it intends to support First Nations in creating sustainable infrastructure. Um, our collective appreciation to you really for sharing the story of the First Nations Infrastructure Institute and providing your insights uh, on improving infrastructure outcomes and, and our knowledge for that matter on this subject. Uh, and I turn to the audience now and, and thanks also to you uh, for your interest in participation. There was a series of fantastic questions and I imagine a bunch that we didn't get to. Um, so this uh, concludes our webinar for today. Thank you again for, for coming out and as Jason said, hanging in there. Um, we really have no sense of, of how it's going for you. So thank you and uh, have a great day.